So while everyone else is bombarding your inbox with all of the crap that you can't afford or are not gonna buy anyway when it comes to Computex, I decided to go ahead and kind of flip the script a little bit. And I'm gonna tell you guys about all the crap you don't actually need that they're peddling. NZXT's build is a quick and easy way to get a new gaming computer. And right now they're proud to announce expansion and availability to Australia, the Netherlands, France, and Italy. Build a gaming PC on your budget using the built-in configurator and see exactly how your favorite games will perform. Want to build your own PC but still have the NZXT peace of mind warranty? Then the new BLD Build It Yourself kit has what you want. Buy it and build it yourself and NZXT has you covered. To get started configuring or building your next gaming PC, visit the build link in the description below. So every time there's a whole new platform launch, uh, if you're not even up to speed on what I'm talking about. Computex is pretty much... So before Computex, you have the pre-Computex show because all the brands want to get their information out before all the noise, causing all the noise before the show, which means it's still noise and you're still probably not going to pay attention to it anyway. But there's a few new uh, things coming out of Computex right now, AM5 being the biggest one. And again, if you're, if you're not familiar with AMD's launch, it's the, pre -la it's the soft launch. Actually, take that back. You have to go back even farther. Months ago, there's the teaser. Then there's the teaser teaser, and then there's the pre-launch, and there's the soft launch, and then there's the hard launch. This isn't the real hard launch because things aren't actually available on shelves. So then the real hard launch comes later, which is when typically everyone's gonna buy it all out and then scalpers will raise the price and stuff anyway. So I think we're like phase two of AMD's like 17 phase launch system. Uh, moving forward, with new platforms always comes new feature sets, new things to talk about, and stuff to really sort of dangle a carrot in front of your face to say, hey, come buy our crap, even though you don't actually need it. So. That's sort of the, the premise of today's video. Now I've done this multiple times, and every single time I do this, the, the list sort of changes a little bit on features you absolutely positively do not need. Now, we're gonna start this off in no particular order, but the latest one, being the fourth time we've actually talked about this since you know PCs have been around, and that's PCIe Gen 5. Well, Jay, why isn't it the fifth time? Well, because you all need PCIe Gen 1. You need the first gen to have any additional gen. So this is the fourth update of PCI, or PCI Express. PCIe Gen 5 uh, comes much sooner and much closer to PCIe G Gen 4's launch than 3 and 4 did. 3 was around for a long time. PCI Gen 3. I mean, anything that connects and needs to talk to the CPU needs a PCI Express lane to do it if it's using PCI Express bus to talk. What has made PCIe Gen 4 popular is the fact that although graphics cards being also PCIe Gen 4 in both latest RDNA technology, RDNA 2 and RDNA 1 for AMD and 30 series uh, graphics cards for NVIDIA, uh, they do not come anywhere close to saturate, saturating the PCIe Express bus. So GPU discussions aside, anyone that tells you you need PCIe Gen 5 or even PCIe Gen 4 for graphics for this matter, run away from them like a wildfire because they really have no idea what they're talking about. The one or 2% is not gonna make a difference anywhere near real world tangible differences that you could even notice. It was storage and storage speed and 3D NAND and NVMe that made PCIe Gen 4 even exciting because of the fact that we were finally getting up over 6,000 megabytes per second read write, well, read speed, and then write speed uh, pretty close to 5,000 megabytes per second. Obtainable and achievable on PCIe Gen 4. PCIe Gen 5 is just a sort of a, a forward compatibility thing because right now there are absolutely no consumer facing, I should say consumer grade PCIe Gen 5 technology to even be had. So you'll have this shiny new PCIe 5 lane that right now nothing can utilize. So although that's gonna seem like a feature set that's nice to have, right now it makes absolutely no difference to you whatsoever. In fact, to even adopt, adopt PCIe Gen 5, you would have to buy a latest platform, whether it be Intel 12th Gen, or now the rumored 13th Gen, which is right around the corner, or AM5. So my point is, if you want it because it's the latest highest number, you're buying a shiny thing right now that has zero support. And by the time it's supported, you'll probably see next gen CPUs or even the TikTok stuff that Intel's been doing and AMD's sort of doing the same thing now. You'll probably see next gen CPUs come out before PCIe Gen 5 products are truly available. You'll see PCIe Gen 5 graphics cards. You'll see PCIe Gen 5 um, storage. Storage should be the only reason whatsoever that you would even consider PCIe Gen 5. It's just a way to upsell and, and continue the artificially inflated prices of components. Now, like I said, in no particular order, large coolers on mid-range graphics cards. This is another way for AIBs to artificially keep the prices high on graphics cards. We've talked about this a million times, yet I still see every time I say, you know, submit your systems for our Jay What Do You Think series, I'll see 
3060s, 3060 Ti's with Strix coolers or big um, for the wind coolers or whatever Galax has or whatever MSI has. And I think to myself, you know, at the hundred to hundred and fifty dollar premium that you've paid for that cooler on a fairly low wattage efficient part, you could have had a 3070 or a 3070 Ti for that matter that would outperform. Now, a 3070 or 3070 Ti with a more base cooler on it, by the way, because you obviously would be paying for the more expensive cooler as well on the 3070 Ti if you got, say, the equivalent Strix for the win, whatever models are out there. There becomes a point where the cooler is absolutely positively overkill. And that is the case for almost every single um, 6600 XT, 6600, 6700, non-XTs, even XTs, 3060s, 3060Ti's, 3070s, these parts do not consume a ton of power. Now, yes, the 3070 is a 250 watt part, but you don't need a 450 watt cooler on a 250 watt GPU. It is a way to keep the prices high. Now, I, I feel like if more people were willing to buy a more base end model graphics card, they would get more for their money without spending a ton of money on the big, giant, lavish coolers. In my opinion, over the last four or five years, this has been one of the greatest scams of all time when it comes to keeping costs high for graphics cards. I, it's, it's basically like having a Ferrari, but when you pop the hood, it's got like a standard Honda 2.0 or 1.8, 1.5 motor inside of it. It's kind of like, it looks cool, but it only goes as fast as the engine itself that's inside of it. And it's just, it, unless you just want to look cool, you're paying for nothing at that point. So do yourself a favor. Consider getting the lower end tier of the hierarchy of graphics cards because all graphics cards themselves are gonna have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 available options in that range. And if you take a look at the price gap between the entry level one and the top tier one, it can sometimes be as much as a graphics card itself. It's ridiculous. So do yourself a favor, stop buying these super massive, giant overkill coolers because they're making up a solid 25% of the cost of the card itself when you just don't need it. So speaking of high temperature parts and you know graphics card coolers and such, let's talk about motherboards for a second here. The latest trend is to just put as many power phases as you can on a motherboard. You guys have noticed the trend over the last couple generations of motherboards, right? Remember when a $200, $250 motherboard was considered high-end and expensive? Now you can't even find baseline motherboards that come with you know, feature sets worth talking about for less than $200. A $700 motherboard from Asus like the Hero can be considered like three or four models from the top where you can buy $2,000 motherboards now, it's insane. It's absolutely insane. But the reason, the, one of the ways that motherboard manufacturers are keeping the cost up, and this has very little to do with you unless you fall in a very niche category, is by putting tons and tons of power phases. And we've seen like 14, 17, 18 power phase motherboards. Imagine taking a 17 phase motherboard like an Intel motherboard, and putting like a 12600K on there. The thing about power phase is it's about stepping down the power cleanly and neatly to whatever's drawing the power, which in this case is gonna be the CPU. It costs money to design, implement, manufacture those power phases. And it's just a way to keep the price up. If you are not going to, look, even if you're getting a 12900K, if you are not planning on trying to overclock that CPU, in fact, we've showed you undervolt it Undervolting it actually takes some stress off of those VRMs as well. Undervolting the CPU gives us the best result in terms of temperature and then still maintaining all of the Intel Turbo Boost Clock technologies. But when you have 17 phases in there, it's things that you're paying for that you don't absolutely need because if you're not gonna be overclocking the CPU using LN2 or some sort of a chiller or you know, sub-zero cooling on the CPU to try and push the clocks as high as you possibly can, you're never gonna come anywhere near needing that type of technology in terms of the power delivery system on your motherboard. There's a there's a rumor slash kind of a mantra that goes with the higher, the end, like more phases, the higher quality parts put into the power delivery system. That is true. We're talking solid capacitors, Jap uh, Japanese capacitors, um, more gold content in the socket, all that sort of stuff. But you know what's funny is I've never once experienced a CPU that seemed like it was being held back 
by putting it on a lower end motherboard versus one of these motherboards that have all the bells and whistles and tassels and dangly things that would make you think that you need it. So if you're building a new system, especially now with AM5 coming out, um, a lot of people are gonna be buying, building new systems from scratch, upgrading, same thing with the new Intel stuff. Don't think that you need any of that stuff. The manufacturer's gonna do the best they can to advertise it and say you need all of these things. But the point here is to say these are things that are nice to have, not need to have. That kind of moves me on to the next point here, which are the, which is CPUs themselves. We are in this like core count race. We've kind of gone as far as we can in terms of the silicon that we have. The processes, of course, are getting smaller. AM5 is based on five nanometer, which is absolutely insane. And like the GPU stuff now that's on there is like six nanometer. Like, because now we're actually seeing RDNA2 make its way onto the CPU die itself. So no longer is it APU, they're actually considered uh, like a discrete graphics that's built onto the CPU. But you guys can watch all the AM5 coverage to know more about that. I'm not gonna go in that today. But once we got about five, two, five, three single core performance, um, that's about as far as the silicon is able to be pushed with non, you know, standard cooling that's available to the consumer easily and reliable. Um, and again, the power delivery systems of the motherboards, the CPUs and, and all that sort of stuff. So what they've started to do is now instead of pushing the boundaries of speed, they're now pushing the boundaries of core density. So that's why you're seeing these Threadripper count CPUs now on mainstream desktop, where back in 2016, if you wanted a 16 core CPU, you had to go Threadripper or you had to go Intel Extreme, which was an eight core 16 thread. Now you can get 24 cores and 48 threads on a mainstream desktop CPU currently with 5000 series AMD or 16 core 24 thread CPUs on Intel. Do you need that many cores? That's the thing. Just five years ago, a four core eight thread i7 Intel CPU was like top of the line. That was like, that was, that was what you needed. That was the best for gaming. The high core count stuff was, again, on alternate platforms like X299 for Intel or Threadripper for AMD. And the only people that even considered needing more than four cores and eight threads was anyone doing content creation, Photoshop, video editing, lots of virtual machines, or anything that was high core count CPU intensive, which was always gonna be professional workflow. It wasn't gamers, it wasn't personal computers at home doing random stuff. Now, I see people post pictures of their system and they're proud of like their 12400, F, which again is a like a four core eight thread CPU and people dog on it because of the fact that it's not high core count. So again, it's like this, this whole idea of you need all these CPUs and stuff is completely, or these, these processors and high core counts is completely bogus. I mean, right now, four core eight thread with hyper threading on both Intel or AMD, AMD calling it simultaneous multi-threading, not hyper threading is more than enough to meet like 90% plus of the average consumer out there and their workloads. When it comes to games and such, if you think you play a game that is highly multi-threaded and you think your CPU is being pegged, just actually open up Task Manager and take a look at your cores and see what the active cores are. And I bet you'll find that none of the threading, like the hyper-threading or simultaneous multi-threading cores are actually truly being touched. It's the main core on any of those nodes or those chiplets or whatever you want to call it that's doing something. They're being passed around to the main core and the hyper-threading core is sitting there idle. So you think, and, and, and you probably won't even see four, maybe six of those threads being utilized in a high CPU usage game. You play any other game, like any sort of shooter or whatever, um, you'll find a world thread that's probably pegged at 100% passing around and a couple of other threads doing things, which is more than likely your system tasks in the background. So you don't need expensive, high core count CPUs, which then circles back to what I said about motherboards, not needing all of those super high massive count VRMs uh, uh, because of the fact that, or power phases, because of the fact that you're not even gonna come close to needing it. So it's about balancing out your system and it's easy to overspend in one area, meaning you won't have the money left to actually benefit from something in another area. If I were to make my choice, I would pick something mid-range on the CPU, get something mid-range low end on the motherboard, and get a better graphics card. Like, that's the way I would personally balance it. Which kind of brings us now to DDR5. It's, it's obvious, all the new platform stuff from Intel and AMD is based on DDR5. 
Currently, with 12th gen, in, 12th, gen, 12th gen Intel, you can choose between DDR4 and DDR5. It's more than likely, though, on 13th gen, you're not going to be able to choose DDR4. DDR4 is going to be phased out. DDR5 is the only place that you're going to have a, a forward move. But DDR5 is one of those things, again, where we saw a doubling of the data rate. We saw a doubling of speed, and it's, it, it's just, again, completely unnecessary. To, to utilize DDR5, if you're on an older gen platform, means that you're gonna have to upgrade everything. And I have no doubt someone watching this video has probably already gone through this, where they upgraded their system, they wanted DDR5. Once they finally found DDR5 and then have to mortgage their house to get it, they built their system and then at the end of the day, they scratched their head because they went, I don't really notice a difference. That's because unless you're doing something that actually utilizes a crap ton of system memory, you're not going to notice. So don't waste money right now on DDR5 if you don't do anything that needs it. If you're sitting there on a 3000 series uh, Ryzen CPU, I'm telling you right now, AM5 is looking very enticing. It's looking very, I want DDR5, I want, or I want AM5, I want DDR5, I want a 4, 40, 000, or 40 series GPU. It's all gonna be, I mean, look, we're enthusiasts, right? Those of us that are want the latest and greatest, but at what cost? Because you'll find that there's a huge diminishing return on even trying to utilize this latest stuff and actually get a cost benefit out of it. It, it still comes entirely down to what it is that you do. My recommendation, honestly, would be upgrade to a 5000 series DDR4 system from AMD. It's super solid. It's been around long enough to have all the kinks worked out. Plenty of uh, BIOS revisions and stuff from motherboards that have made them super stable with the latest memories and stuff. Go and peruse the Intel forums when it comes to 12th gen on like Reddit or whatever and, and read about some of the issues that are coming about of DDR5 compatibility, um, the, the weird wonkiness. I just, don't take our word for it. I mean, I'm the only one running 12th gen right now in the studio because we need our systems to be as reliable as possible. So Phil is on the complete opposite of DDR or DDR5 and Intel 12th gen. He's still on Threadripper with DDR4 and couldn't be happier. But just don't take our word for it. Go and read what the other people are saying. Another thing too, that you can completely and utterly waste money on are expensive fans. Look, fans are kind of like the, the latest thing to become sort of a bragging point in your system. It's like, look at all these Lee and Lee Uni fans that I have, or look at all these Corsair SP120 fans I have. Yeah, look at my maglev bearings, and look at my RGBs and all that stuff. But you know when you, you compare the performance of like, it, it, 10 years ago, a $4.50 120 millimeter Yate Loon fan was like the most popular fan that you could put in your system because of performance to price. This predates RGB. Around then, the best you could hope for is finding either a white, a blue, or a red, or possibly a green LED fan, which again, just were LEDs that lit up with the fan, but you had to choose the color. But as time went on, manufacturers found way to squeeze a lot of money out of the consumer by adding a lot of bells and whistles to fans. Here's the thing, there's still just like the four basic sleeve or bearing types when it comes to fans. And the ultimate reliability of the fan itself is gonna rely on that bearing type. The RGB, you know, the, the adjustable RPMs or some fans, you know, zero RPM now capable. All that stuff is, is just extra that doesn't provide any sort of increase to the user experience. RGB is an arguable thing because a lot of people love the idea of RGB. Most people hate RGB because of the marketing behind it, not because of the, you know, the product itself. But $30 for a fan, I, when I started YouTube, my white water-cooled system that I had that had two radiators and it was in a giant Switch 810 case, I didn't even have $30 worth of fans in the entire case, let alone one fan that's 30 bucks. Now you look at like a three pack of some of these RGB fans or $100 or more, which is absolutely ridiculous. And do you think that those fans fail at a lesser rate? I got news for you. I, we have had $5 fans that are still going and we've had $35 fans that failed on us and had bearings that started wobbling and started making ticking sounds or, the, or they go as they're spinning. We've all experienced it. It's still a fan. It's like you can strap all the to it that you want, but it's still just a fan. And then for honorable mention, we're gonna talk about RGB. Look, RGB should not be something that you seek. It should be something that you end up with. What do I mean by that? If you go, I want this RGB thing, it's, it's, it's a terrible way to shop. It should be the last feature that you look for in a component. If you buy a high-end graphics card, if you buy a high-end motherboard, if you buy a high-end case, 
you're going to get RGB with it. It's, it's a given. It's an automatic. You should not shop at that upper echelon of pricing thinking that you're getting necessarily more for your money depending on what your use case is. Now that theme holds true for every category I've said today. But I've seen, I've seen someone like on Twitter, I don't remember who, exactly when it was, but they were asking like, hey, who has the best RGB? And that's a, that's a question I had never actually seen someone ask before. But it really got me thinking like, Everyone's implementation of RGB is different in some way. You've got the JST connectors, you've got the standard connectors, you've got 12 volt. 12 volt RGB is kind of like disappearing now. It's actually hard to find 12 volt RGB, which is the four pins, and it's just straight up, all the LEDs do the same thing. Everything's addressable now. And you're finding that with that comes uh, proprietary controllers and such where, well, they've got to use their control box or whatever. Fortunately, if they use a JST connector like I showed with my system, then they can be converted to the, to the three pin motherboard header RGB, which will allow you to be able to kind of control everything uh, with one system. In my case, it's gonna be Asus Aura. But you've got Asus Aura, you've got Mystic Light, you've got, um, well, I guess it's through Precision X is how you control EVGA's uh, RGB lighting. You've got Corsair's IQ, you've got Lee and Lee L Connect. You've got so many different types of RGB. In fact, my, my system at home has four different RGB softwares to control everything, and it's a pain in the ass. But at the end of the day, once I take the time to set it all up, I love the way my system looks. But RGB should absolutely be last on your list of concerns or something that you're seeking, because you're gonna automatically get it if you shop at like a certain price point and above. Anyway, with all of the news of Computex happening right now, um, I wanted to give you guys something different in your inbox that wasn't just the same boring ass material regurgitated 15 different ways to give you guys something to think about when you go, oh wow, I want this new thing. Maybe hold off and save your money for a little bit and just sort of wait. Unless you absolutely have to buy something now, it doesn't mean you should buy the latest gen. In fact, we have a whole video about what to expect when you buy something la latest gen, cutting edge, bleeding edge technology. There's some food for thought there too. So make sure you guys go and seek out that video and see what we had to say about that. What are your absolute wastes of money that you think nobody should ever pay for or shop for? Put it down in the comments below and uh, maybe I'll heart the best ones. That way they can be pushed to the top so you guys can get some recognition for those opinions. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.